Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Neil Seidman, and I'm the co-chair of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. And I've really been looking forward to this webinar, Getting Help for Complicated Grief. And our presenter is Dr. Katherine Shear. And we're going to be recording the webinar, so you'll be able to see it again on the ADAA website. And during the webinar, you can type in your questions. So if you look on the right side of your screen, you should see a Q&A panel. And there's a little field at the bottom of that panel. And when you click in it, you can type in your question. Then either hit your Enter key or click the icon. Uh, you can uh, type in your questions at any time during the webinar, and then we'll have a Q&A period uh, at the end. We'll get to as many questions as we can. So before we begin, I'd like to say a little about ADAA, uh, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. ADAA was started back in 1979. And today it's the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety disorders and depression. Our mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, like this webinar, through practice, and through research. We work to end stigma and get the word out that these conditions are real, serious, and treatable. And I want to encourage you to visit the ADA website. It's really a wonderful resource. So it's adaa.org. And you can support ADAA by making a charitable donation on the website. Okay, so I'm really happy to introduce our presenter. Dr. Katherine Shear has spent more than three decades researching and developing successful treatments for anxiety disorders, depression, and complicated grief. And her work with complicated grief began in the mid-1990s uh, when she began the treatment development work that culminated in several studies confirming the efficacy of a targeted complicated grief treatment. Dr. Shear is the director of the Center for Complicated Grief at the Columbia School of Social Work. She is the principal investigator of the Complicated Grief Research Program at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And she's professor of psychiatry at the Columbia School of Social Work and at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. So now let me turn it over to Dr. Shear. Thanks so much, Neil, and welcome to everyone who's uh, joining us tonight. It's a pleasure really to be here to tell you a little bit about um, basically how you can get help for complicated grief, but to do that, of course, I'm going to need to tell you a little bit about what complicated grief is. And what I'm going to do is also talk to you about kind of what's behind this treatment. I'm, going to, I'm just going to kind of outline the treatment for you, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, what the thinking is that goes into it so that you understand what it is we do when we, when we do complicated grief treatment. And um, what you'll see on this slide is a link to um, our website, which is www.complicatedgrief.org, which is, in essence, the Center for Complicated Grief, because what we are is primarily a, a center for disseminating information about this condition and for training professionals in the treatment. You might notice that um, that actually our kind of our motto, I guess you would say, is that grief is a form of love, and that might surprise you, but we're going to come back to that, and I will hopefully explain it to you. So as you may or may not know, there are about 60 million people die every year 
worldwide, and about two and a half million of those are in the United States. And it's interesting that we, we actually don't have a formal definition of bereavement. And in, in other words, we don't have an operational definition, that one that we can change into a research study. So therefore, we don't really know exactly uh, how many people are bereaved every year, but we estimate that the people who are bereaved, of course, are the close friends and relatives of people who die. And we estimate that each of us has, on average, about three of those people who are very close to them. And we do know that if, um, if we ask in an epidemiologic study how many, you know, have you ever lost someone important, about 60% of the population will say yes to that. So that's a lot of people, right? That's a lot of bereaved people. We'll come back to that again. And I mean, for sure, bereavement is a universal experience. We all share bereave the, the experience of bereavement. But the reaction to bereavement, grief, can leave us and often does leave us feeling more alone and confused and unsettled than almost anything else we experience in life. And it's, it's something that until you experience it, you don't really have an idea of what it's like. And that's one of the things that bereaved people often say, um, that they, they don't understand, you know, no one really ever, no one ever told them what to expect with this, even when they expect someone to die. So it's a very, very intense, profound experience. And one of the things that's so difficult about it is that it naturally leaves people feeling this, feeling very alone, as I said, very alone and confused and unsettled, and, and feeling disconnected from the world. And, you know, many, many famous authors actually Sometimes I think that every single novelist writes, of course, every novelist writes about sex, and they all also write about grief and loss. So there are some wonderful descriptions of the experience of grief in, in the world of novels. This is just one of them, this quote from Charles Dickens, which I'm not going to read, but it is a beautiful quote. So I want to talk a little first about grief, because grief really is a shorthand word for a complex, multifaceted, time-varying experience. Grief is not one thing. It's one word, but it's not one thing. And in the, in the grief world, there's a kind of mantra that everyone grieves in their own way. And that is absolutely true. Um, it's, it's, it is one of the, I guess, well, you know, we, we all have anxiety disorders in our own way, too. We all have have we all, certainly we all love in our own way. But in the case of grief, it's important to remember that, again, there are different patterns and different stories of grief for different people, even after the same loss. So you can, you can have two people grieving the same exact person in a, and they um, are experiencing something very, very different. And also, even for any person, any one of us, we have typically have a range of different thoughts and feelings and behaviors and different kinds of social interactions, even different bodily changes that, that vary from month to month, from week to week, and actually even from day to day or hour to hour and sometimes even minute to minute, the thoughts and feelings and behaviors are changing. And then there's a different way that the story unfolds and changes over time as it's gradually woven into our lives, because that's what happens after someone dies. We don't really ever, we don't really ever stop grieving, or we, in, in the sense that grief, as we'll see, is, is pretty much defined by yearning and longing and sadness. And if, you know, I don't know how many people in this group have lost someone close, but generally speaking, when I speak to an audience, the majority of people have had that experience. And, um, and you know, sometimes it's a long time ago. My own mother died in 1998, and um, I was very close to her, and I had a period of acute grief. But today, 
what is it like almost almost what 15 more than 15 years later I can still feel sad when I speak of her or think of her I can still miss her wish she was back with us and that's a form of grief that's not nothing right so what happens though is that generally speaking grief has a kind of a story grief basically emerges naturally after we lose someone close and I like to say it seeks its rightful place in our lives so right after my mother died I was pretty overwhelmed with sadness and really wasn't interested in much else except thinking about her honoring her memorializing her figuring out what to do with her things that sort of thing but that didn't last so very long and you know and, and, and so the feeling subsided and gradually I began to kind of change my relationship with her um, and now I you know I go on about my life I have periods of good happiness and I my life is really fine but I still miss her and so I still have now what we call integrated grief so let's go back and talk a little about this kind of transformation so the, what we say is that right after someone dies we experience something called acute grief which typically when we lose someone very close takes us to a place that's highly highly emotional we get very emotionally activated again with a lot of sadness and sorrow but also with longing and yearning so sadness yearning and longing are sort of the heart of grief and then most of us do feel anxiety also during a period of acute grief we it's it's a, a feeling of anxiety to be separated from someone who's very important in your life someone who is what we would call an attachment figure so we feel anxiety we very often also feel anger um, we people very often feel um, some kind of guilt or remorse and all of this is absolutely normal and um, and it can be accompanied these these emotions are kind of on a roller coaster and they can be accompanied by even um, sort of very unusual other psychological experiences like for example hallucinations um, people about 60 percent of people will will report some kind of feeling of some kind of sensory experience of the person being present and that can be very disconcerting if you don't know that almost that the majority of people have some of those experiences and then also the way that you're thinking is kind of out of control because your thoughts are so caught up there's so so many insistent thoughts about um, the person who died but and and it's such a it's so difficult to really um, manage and control emotions and that's for most people very very unfamiliar so it can be hard sometimes to see that this unsettling response is adaptive so we want to talk about <clears throat> how it's adaptive and what happens that helps us adapt to a difficult loss and to do that we're going to talk about the commonality so grief is unique to each person it's not one thing it changes over time but it also does have some commonalities and that those commonalities are also important because they offer a kind of framework and a way of understanding what we're experiencing when we experience grief and, and a little bit about some of the things we can expect so it's important to recognize and really honor the fact that everyone grieves in their own way and also to recognize the commonalities in grief so let's pause for a minute and define some terms because this is another thing about this whole area is that we use these terms <coughs> excuse me in different ways um, and this isn't you know they're not right and wrong I'm not saying that this has to be the way that you define bereavement but this is the way that many um, thanatologists or sort of uh, grief researchers define 
bereavement, which is just the experience of the death of a loved one, and we use the term grief just to refer to the response to that loss. And then we be interested in adaptation or psychological processes that uh, facilitate adaptation. So grief itself has different forms. Um, it has sort of micro forms that I was just talking about that, you know, that can vary even as frequently as minute to minute or hour to hour. But then there's, there's a period really after you lose someone of acute grief, which is this initial response, which can be very intense and all-encompassing, but it's, it's not permanent, okay? It's usually transformed during a kind of adaptive process or healing process. And what it's transformed to is what we call integrated grief, which is a much more background kind of state. So if, when that transformation doesn't happen is when we experience the condition we call complicated grief. So complicated grief really isn't all that complicated. It simply refers to a form of grief in which the acute, the, the acute grief symptoms persist, um, and, and there's no sense of progress. And that's because of complicating thoughts, feelings, or behaviors, which we're going to talk about. And so this is using the term complicated in its medical sense. So you may be aware that if you have a wound, you can get, you might have a wound complication. If it gets infected, we call that a wound complication. Or if you get pneumonia after you've had um, a heart attack or something, we might say that that is a complication as well. So it's a superimposed problem that impedes the natural healing process. Is what we, that's all we mean by complicated, and that's what we see here. So um, just to say a few more words about the psychological processes that are entailed, really, in, the, in adaptation to loss, basically, Again, it's, it's, there's a simple framework here. Exactly how it's implemented is variable. It's very variable and very individual. But basically, we need to find a way to acknowledge, to really fully acknowledge the reality of the loss. And that may seem like it's obvious, but actually what this means is that we have to, we have to find a way to comprehend the finality of the loss and the consequences, what it means to our life. And in fact, it's very, very difficult. If you've, if you've lost someone, you know this, it's very difficult to really understand right after someone dies that they're not coming back. I mean, it's just, it seems impossible. You know, how could this person who was alive yesterday not be here anymore? And how could it be that they're not ever coming back? So that's a process. That's not something that we can really understand right away. So that's part of what we have to do to adapt to the loss. Additionally, we've had an ongoing relationship with someone very, very important to us. And, and people we love, um, we now know a lot about love relationships. And really to understand grief, as I'll, as I'll explain in a minute, we need to understand love because in order to understand what we lose when we lose something, we have to understand what we have when we have it. So um, people we love are basically kind of, um, they, they really literally become a part of us in the form of memories in, in our brain. So they are, they are interwoven in our memory system. They are included in our memory system. And we don't really ever um, basically lose them because the people we love have a very special place in our memory. So when they die, though, our relationship with them changes in a very major way. And when that happens, we have to, we have to kind of revise these, these memories, the memory system. We call that a mental representation of the person who died. We have to revise that. And the third thing we have to do is we have to figure out what our life is going to be like moving forward. So again, when someone very close dies, it can seem like life really doesn't have much point anymore. It very often seems that way right in the beginning. It can seem like it will be impossible to ever feel joy or satisfaction again. 
But that's exactly what we have to figure out, is how are we going to do that? How are we going to feel joy and satisfaction and be able to be happy again um, with this person gone? So it turns out that most of the time, people do adapt to even the most painful loss. But about 7% overall of bereaved people are not able to do that, and they develop the syndrome that we call complicated grief. And as I said, it's not, a, it's not complicated itself, but it is a chronic condition that can bring a person's life really to a standstill, or if not their whole life to a standstill, their inner life to a standstill. And what we've found, what we've learned over the past couple of decades, um, when a lot of people have been studying this, but when our group in particular has been studying it, is that most people with complicated grief do need treatment. They do need some really a, a, um, probably a focused kind of treatment. So that's what, that's what we basically set out to do back in the mid-1990s. I was working at the time at the University of Pittsburgh, and there was a young postdoctoral fellow there named Holly Priggerson, who has subsequently done a lot of really wonderful work in this area. And she had just um, basically identified this syndrome and, and created a way to, um, to identify a questionnaire, basically, that was very, very good at screening people who were suffering from complicated grief. And it was, and, and they started, actually, she was working with our late life depression research group back then. And, um, and what they found was that, that um, grief symptoms that she was identifying as complicated grief were not responding to the treatments for depression that this group was very, very good at, um, at, at using. And so neither medication nor psychotherapy was helping um, people with, with, with their complicated grief symptoms. So they, I was doing anxiety disorder research at the time, and um, so they came and kind of knocked on my door. I was also interested in psychotherapy especially, and so um, I, you know, they asked me if I would help, and I said that I would try to do that, and then really got very, very um, fascinated by this whole problem. So but the, the first problem I had was trying to figure out how to, how to develop a treatment for complicated grief. So, so basically the logic behind doing this was to first understand what complicated grief was. Um, that wasn't immediately obvious. And really to understand how is it different from usual grief, from what we might call adaptive grief. And I should say that in my own training, I had, of course, learned about grief. I learned about the importance of loss. But I found in the mid-'90s, after I'd been out of my training for some 20 years, that I really didn't think I did know very much about grief. So I had to go back and learn. And I, I basically learned from the grief counselors in the Pittsburgh area a tremendous amount, and also from reading. Um, people who had been writing and reading novelists and reading poets and reading researchers, all of that. But, you know, I thought, well, if I'm going to understand grief, I have to understand loss. Like I said a minute ago, what is loss when a loved one dies? So if it, only by knowing what it is that we've lost can we figure out what we have to do to adapt and, and you know, adapt to that loss. So... Um, so basically, to answer that question, we have to answer, we, we need to understand close relationships. And the, it turns out there is now a very large literature of, there's a large body of research um, about what close relationships that are sometimes called attachment relationships, what are they and what do they do for us in our lives? And, and basically, what do we do for them? Because as adults, we have people who, are, who we are attached to in the sense that they take care of us. And by that, I mean um, these are people who are rewarding to be with and people who serve what are called a safe haven and secure base for us. And a safe haven means that these are people we turn to when we're upset and they comfort us and they help us problem solve 
and they basically are there by our side. And they're also people who are a secure base for us, which is a person who's basically there in the background when we're feeling fine and when we're going out in the world and doing new things and trying new things and learning and performing in the world. And so these people are very, very important in our life. And generally speaking, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, only a couple of them at any given time. So obviously, we're, this is our parents when we're very small. Usually our mothers are our primary attachment figures, so to speak. And then as we get older and get into move into adolescence, we tend to start to move towards peer groups as best friends and then romantic partners as our primary close relationships. And then, of course, we have our own children. And um, then the caregiving aspect comes into play, actually, of a love relationship around probably earlier than adolescence, but certainly during that adolescent transition. So that as adults, we have people who are our secure base and safe haven, and we provide those functions for the people we love. And that's, I think, very important to understand in understanding bereavement. So, um, so we, I want to say one other thing about what we've learned about close relationships is that they are, are you know, they're very, very important. We didn't have to study them to know that. Everyone in the audience knows that. I know that. Everyone I know knows that. But it turns out that they're even more important than we know. So, so our close relationships affect us psychologically and also physiologically, biologically, in ways that we are not aware of. So they affect us very much in ways that we're aware of. They affect us also very much in ways that we're not aware of. So they help us regulate our emotions. They help us regulate our thinking, our decision making, um, just a whole myriad of psychological functions. They contribute to our sense of self. They, they help define us. And they also contribute to the regulation of our bodies, uh, to our blood pressure, our heart rate, our immune system function. These, these are, there's literally um, dozens of studies of these different functions and how our close relationships affect them. So when we lose someone like that, it's basically like an earthquake. It's like shakes the very foundation of our lives. So it isn't surprising that it's such an intense, intense experience. So lastly, we have to, in, in order to help people with complicated grief, we need to devise ways to resolve the complications and facilitate natural adaptive processes. So um, again, the commonalities in acute grief are the intense yearning and longing, the feelings of disbelief, the insistent distracting thoughts of the deceased person to the point that we can have trouble focusing on anything else. Um, we have a loss of a sense of self and sense of purpose very commonly, and we feel disconnected from other people and from ongoing life. That was the Dickens quote um, earlier on. But thankfully, acute grief is usually time limited. And it's time limited because we learn. We learn how to understand the finality and consequences of the loss. We learn how to reshape in a way our relationship with the person who died so we can keep them with us in our hearts, but they are not, we're not constantly expecting them to show up and being disappointed, essentially. And we also learn how to think of our, of our own future, ourselves and our future in a new way. And to do that, we need to regulate our emotions. And this slide, which I'm not going to go into in, in depth, um, just just um, list some of the ways that we that we do that, that we manage and regulate our emotions. And we do that both by by kind of managing our negative emotions, keeping them at at a at a somewhat even keel, because they're they're not really at an even keel during acute grief. They're just your emotions just aren't. But um, but we do kind of oscillate between being really intensely confronted with painful emotions and, and setting them aside. Our, our minds do that naturally. And then we're going to talk about some of these other ways of 
managing negative emotions. And very important during a period of acute grief is the idea of facilitating positive emotions. That's what, another really good way to regulate emotions. And again, we'll be talking more about that. So luckily, we have some building blocks for adaptation to loss. One of them is self-compassion. And this is a concept that's, um, that kind of comes from, from Eastern thinking, Eastern, to some degree, Eastern religious thinking. But um, the idea of self-compassion has been uh, articulated, I think, very well by someone named Kristen Neff. You can read about her on the internet if you want. You can go watch her give a TED talk. Um, she, she's very lovely, but she has, she's kind of organized thinking about self-compassion, describing it as being kind to oneself and not judgmental and critical, and, and remembering that suffering and making mistakes even is part of what ties us to other people, part of what is really most characteristic of our common humanity, rather than when, when we do one of these things or we, when we do something wrong or we suffer in some way, we very often feel isolated, and that's a problem. And the third aspect of self-compassion is being mindful or, or um, avoiding over-identification with emotions. So we're going to have emotions. Uh, you know, we, we have very strong emotions during acute grief, and that's perfectly natural. We just have to be a little bit careful not to get so caught up in them that we forget that there's, that there's other things in our lives besides those strong emotions. And whenever we have strong emotions, it's easy for that to happen. So self-compassion is one of the things that can really help us. We also know that we have intrinsic needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness that are within all of us. And really what autonomy means, basically, not independence, but rather sort of inner intrinsic um, interests and values. And those are there regardless of whether someone that we love is there or not. We still have these within us. And so we can, we can basically draw on those as we um, start to adapt to a loss. And lastly, we have this mechanism called psychological immunity, which you can think of as somewhat similar to physical immunity that protects us from, um, you know, from bad things happening to our bodies, from invasion of our bodies. And the psychological immune system protects us from threats to our mind, basically, to our psychological well-being, not exactly our mind, but to our psychological well-being. And it operates behind the scenes if we don't get in its way. So um, self-compassion, again, is very, very important. This slide just talks about what compassion is, um, and, and we need to remember to apply it to ourselves. So it as I said, it, it entails being kind and understanding of our own suffering and failings rather than being harsh and self-critical. It entails seeing our suffering as part of the larger human experience rather than separating and isolating us. And of having mindful acceptance of painful thoughts and feelings rather than being self-pitying or over-identifying with the pain. Self-compassion is not being selfish or self-centered or prioritizing one's own needs over those of others. And it's not self-pity. So that's basically, self-compassion self is something that people can do for themselves. They can, there's lots of ways to learn self-compassion. It's one of the ways that people can really get help for themselves. Just a few words about self-determination theory, um, because this is part of what helps us move forward in our lives. So self-compassion helps us, us with that first part of what we need to do to adapt, which is to, to really make peace and accept the painful finality and consequences of the loss. So there's a lot of emotional pain in that, and self-compassion can really help with that. Self-determination theory can help us, can help us um, 
move forward in our own lives. So basically, what these are psychological, social psychology researchers who've been studying these processes for quite a long time and have really documented across cultures and in, in all different age groups. It's really pretty clear that people have intrinsic motivation for self-initiated behaviors. For it, we, we need to have a feeling of volition, meaning that we, we basically um, have an inner need to, to express our authentic interests and values. And we also have a need to feel competent, to feel able to face and meet challenges in things that are important to us. And we have a very basic need for relatedness or a feeling of belonging and mattering to other people. And so this is also going to help us move forward in reconnecting with people in the world when we're bereaved. The psychological immune system, again, is our implicit or out of awareness mechanisms that protect this sense of competence and integrity and feelings of of being worthwhile in the face of negative experiences. And they really work unless we um, stand in their way. And one of the ways we can stand in their way, it turns out, is if we don't know they exist, that, 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 that the psychological immune system exists, so that, um, so that we, try, we, we might focus so much on wanting the person back in this situation that we're not really um, we're trying not very, a person with complicated grief is very frequently trying very hard not to think about um, the fact that they're gone and of course, and that they're not coming back. And that's exactly what they need to do for the psychological immune system to work. And when all of these processes do um, work smoothly, then we end up, as I mentioned earlier, with integrated grief which is basically the state of mind that we have about the loss when the loss has been basically accepted. And complicated grief is what happens when acute grief persists without a feeling of meaningful progression. So you have these acute grief symptoms, and then we have the grief complications. And I just want to say a few words about what they are. So they are psychological, so that means their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and sometimes they're also something in the environment. But what the thoughts are, mostly these are thoughts that are kind of second-guessing, if-only kinds of thoughts where we're very focused on how uh, we call it counterfactual thinking on how things could have been different. So this is the thought, if only I had diagnosed some, you know, my loved one, if only I had noticed more that they were ill and I didn't and they didn't get to the doctor early enough and so the, the treatment didn't work and they died, but if, if only I had gotten them to the doctor earlier or if only they had gone to the doctor earlier or if only the doctor had done something differently or if only I hadn't gone out or the, I hadn't let my son or daughter take the car that night when there was a terrible accident. It's very easy to get caught up in one of these kinds, in, in some kind of second guessing, if only kind of thinking. We almost always have some of that. And we have to basically remind ourselves that um, it, what's usually almost virtually always true, which is that there's no way we could have done that. And even if there was a way, it wasn't something that we, we didn't understand it at the time. So what the problem for right now is, is that the person really is gone. The problem with feelings is that we don't successfully regulate emotions. And the problem with behaviors is primarily excessive avoidance of reminders of the loss. So people are upset, and this is very, very important because people are, of course, we're upset by reminders, 
of the person who died. And because of that, we have a tendency to want to evade them, avoid them. And very often, other people think it's a good idea, too. So if going to a certain restaurant reminds me of someone I lost, my, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to say, well, I don't need to go to that restaurant anymore. And my friends and family might well say, well, honey, you know, just find another restaurant to go to. It's easy enough to find another restaurant. You don't have to go back to that restaurant. But that, of course, turns out to compound the problem. And it's especially problematic when the person that you lost is someone so close because then there's almost, there's nothing that doesn't remind you of them, literally almost. And so we see people sometimes who are, are actually literally sitting in their home trying to figure out what they're going to do to where they can go and what they can do that won't remind them of the person who died. And that really doesn't work. Lastly, there are, are sometimes, this is more rare, but there are sometimes situations, we, we don't grieve well alone, and there are sometimes situations where there's just no one in our life, and that can be problematic, or where people around us are actually hostile and blaming, and that's very, very problematic. So given all this, we set about to develop and test a treatment. And here's what, here's how basically we did it. So I want to show you. So we just talked about how bereavement triggers acute grief symptoms and also a natural adaptive healing process that ends up with integrated grief. But sometimes in addition to in addition to triggering acute grief symptoms, we find ourselves with grief complications that interfere with healing. So what are we going to do to help someone who's in that situation? Well, we're going to basically work with them to try to resolve those complicating problems and to facilitate the natural healing process. So in doing so, we, we always remind people of our basic philosophy, which is that grief is a form of love. And why do I say that? Let me just explain, because if you think about it, um, when, when someone you love very much dies, do you stop loving them? No, of course not. But is the love the same as it was before they died? Not really. Because, and the reason why it's not the same is because you can't feel affection or even think about the person without also feeling a lot of sadness and yearning and longing. And so the affection itself is now infused with sadness, yearning, and longing. And that's exactly a description of grief. So in essence, love has been transformed to grief. And that's a very natural process. And over time, the balance of sort of the it, grief has really become bittersweet. And so there is some comfort in, in the, the form that love takes as we move on in life after someone has died. But it's always got that grief. And, and we don't want to ever say that grief is is not okay or that it's abnormal in any way. What, what's problematic and complicated grief are the complications. So we need to accept grief. And this is so kind of difficult to do. It's very difficult for most people. It takes a lot of um, trust, actually, in oneself, in basically in other people, and in the world. Okay, so um, the the treatment actually has some, uh, a number of different components that focus on what we call that loss focus, which is the way that we have to make peace with the finality and consequences of the loss, and the restoration focus, which is the way that we have to think about our lives moving forward. And this slide kind of tells you some of the components of the treatment, but I'm not really going to talk to you about that tonight, except to show this to you and to tell you that this is a treatment that has now been tested in three different NIMH-funded randomized controlled trials and found to be efficacious. It contains seven core modules, again, just listed here. Um, so you get some idea of what we do when we do the treatment, but we don't, I, don't, I think I'm over time already, and um, 
So I want to bring this to a close so I can answer some of the questions. So um, we do this in a 16-session format. We provide the modules in a 16-session format. And this is just a slide to show you what I mean that it's evidence tested. And so I'm going to end at that point, and um, we have a few minutes at least for for questions. And I see we do have some questions. Thank, so Neil, thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Sherry. We have some very interesting questions. We'll try to get to uh, as many as we can. So here's a very interesting question. Uh, can one develop complicated grief after divorce? Yes, well, it's interesting that that's the first question because I will, I've will i probably given, I don't know, hundreds of talks similar to this one, and I've never given a talk when that question was answered, when it wasn't asked. <laughs> and and the, the answer is that um, I'm almost, yes, some, some, yes, you can develop complicated grief after other kinds of losses. We know that. There's data to show that, and I've personally seen people who have, um, have after a breakup, like a divorce, or I, I do know of a case, several cases, with actually someone who came to one of our studies um, wanted to be treated for divorce, and we don't do that. So she said that um, she had lost her mother, and she told us, I guess she really had lost her mother, but she, she answered all the questions deliberately, inaccurately, because she really wanted to be treated for the loss, for a divorce, a very painful divorce. So we ended up doing that because um, w once we had her <laughs> in our study, we felt obliged to do it. But that, yes, definitely. So the same principles would apply to the loss involved uh, in going through a divorce? Well, I think, I think similar principles. Similar, so would, okay. Yeah, I think not there's, exactly there's the some, same. not exactly, not exactly, but similar, yes. Similar enough that I think we could use um, you know, we could use some of the same approaches, many of the same approaches. Because losing, you know, any kind of separation from, meaningful separation from someone we love creates havoc. It just does. And especially if it's, if it's pretty much permanent. And so that's a very natural reaction, and it's one that people don't expect and feel, you know, so that, that whole constellation is true after other kinds of losses. I think just recognizing that that a divorce can have a lot of similarities with losing a loved one uh, can be helpful, at, at least in acknowledging that this is understandable what people are going through. Right, right. And another question that uh, is a really great question, What do you have some comments on uh, the connection of complicated grief and the, your complicated grief treatment in regard to uh, veterans that have experienced PTSD. So maybe they've lost a buddy or just experienced uh, tremendous trauma. Right, right. Well, so I am working with someone named Steve Koza, who's been doing a, um, well, he's been doing a bereavement study in family members of the military. but. I have other colleagues who've been working in the VAs, and many of them do believe that um, that there's a, there's a problem with complicated grief <clears throat> that many veterans are experiencing complicated grief. I, I have gotten emails from people saying they think that complicated grief is more of a problem even than PTSD for some you know for some um, some service members and. I guess, you know, it really, it, because that does happen, that people lose their buddies and, and they can be very, very close. People can be very, very close, of course, to um, colleagues that they are in combat with, especially. So, yes, but that we've done relatively little with that. We really need to work with veterans, but so far um, we haven't really been able to make inroads into that area. And here's a question uh, maybe you could give a, a, a short answer to, or if you could summarize, uh, the uh, uh, participant wants to know or have some idea, how did you determine the 7%? Like, is it a certain length of time that people are stuck with the grief? How did you determine that about 7% uh, people going through grief have complicated grief where they're not progressing? <laughs> 
that was an epidemiologic study done in Germany, and they used mm -hmm. a um, they they used and it's the most conservative estimate, which is why I use it. Um, but they they used a so there isn't a standard rating scale. It's it's a very good question because we don't really have a great way of doing that right this minute. Um, and, and one of the issues is the time frame, and there, there's a lot of, you know, discussion around that. We don't really know what the time frame is. Um, it, it, there is some data that sometime around six months on average is when people start to not, you know, grief is not over, for heaven's sakes. It's never over, and it's not, you know, it's not sort of all the way in the background, but that there's been... Uh, there, there seems to be a kind of qualitative transition somewhere around that time. There's some data for that, and there's a lot of people who think that's way too early. Um, it, you know, and, and there is a, it, it depends on, on the loss. So on average, um, it's, it's quite, a, quite a lot longer if someone loses a child, for example. Um, it's longer probably if you lose someone who you've been very, very close to a romantic partner. But, um, you know, we're not trying, sometimes, you know, this is really a matter of helping people who are struggling with grief. And it is a way of helping them that seems to be pretty efficacious. It, the, the, this treatment that we're talking about is 16 sessions long. It's time limited. It's not, you know, sort of get into therapy and take your whole life apart. So it's very focused, it's very targeted, it's very structured. And um, so right now we're seeing people on average about three or four years after they lose someone. And, you know, pretty much everyone around them is, is kind of, um, you know, done with the grief with them. And that's not such a good thing. So they, they need someone to be by their side. And um, so... That is, a, it, is that a short enough answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that really gives a good perspective. I think that that uh, uh, you're not saying, oh, more than a few months, and you need to do something different. But three to four years on the average for people that have been uh, going through the treatment. Um, here's a question um, uh, from a practitioner. Uh, what are your thoughts about providing the CG uh, complicated grief treatment to a client that has uh, almost no social support and uh, is homeless? Well, we have done that. I would say we've done that. It's mm -hmm. challenging. Um, we certainly work to try to figure out ways to uh, – one of the things we would do in that treatment would be to, to look for opportunities for – um, some kind of opening up some kind of social um, activities. But we, we still work with people. Yes, we would work with someone like that. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions uh, from our audience wanting to know how would they be able to find out about the availability of your program? Is there, would, would they go to your website to yes. keep Yes, on what's yes. available. Yes, and they can. There's a way to contact us through the website also. That okay. You know, for and that's complicatedgrief.org. Dot dot yes. Okay, complicatedgrief.org. So that's a great answer. Uh, we have time just for a couple more questions. So here's a question. Can self-harming be one of the symptoms of complicated grief? Well, I would never say never, but it's not, it's certainly not a common one. Could it okay. ever be? I don't know. I really don't. I think it would probably, it would probably indicate that there's something else going on as well, but, you know. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting question. Um, you, you talked about a part of the normal grieving process where people will uh, have a sense or even a hallucination or, or 
feeling of the presence of the person that they lost. And so we have a question, uh, if someone is still having those experiences, you know, years later, uh, is that complicated grief or is that still part of the normal integration process? Well, that's, I wouldn't say, one symptom never would make something complicated grief, and, and so I, I really don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it, it would really depend on, it would depend on how frequent it is. It would also depend on what else was going on in the person's life, because we do adapt to losses in very individual ways. So if every, you know, if in every other way, um, the person is enjoying their life, they're, they're um, engaged in their life, and things are going reasonably well, I would not consider that complicated grief, absolutely not. But if it were okay, part of the whole answer. constellation, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, but people are so interested in what you're doing. Uh, here's a question. Do you have a treatment manual yet for CGT? We do. You do? Um, okay. We do, yes. And can and again, people find out again through the website? Absolutely. Okay, great. We have time for maybe just one more question. Um, oh, here's an interesting question. Is, is part of the complicated uh, grief treatment uh, uh, involved with helping or encouraging the individual to find another attachment figure to kind of replace the person that's been lost, just not replace them, but in the sense of the safe haven and the secure base. Um, is that part of the, part of the uh, sessions? Is it part of what we do? And are, no, we are don't, people we don't encouraged to find, to go out into the world and find another a figure to to be close to, another person to be close to, to provide oh, okay. that safety. Okay, if you say it that way, yes. We, well, yes, I think we all need a confidant. We need close, we need someone close. It, it makes it so much more, um, it, it's so much more manageable to, to basically grieve and adapt to a loss. We need people in our lives and we need people who are close to us. I wouldn't think of it as replacing that person. I don't think that's really the right way to think of it. But I do think we, you know, the, we, yes, we, we do encourage, we strongly encourage, and we, we actually um, try to help people reconnect with someone, at least some one other important person in their life. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shear, uh, for a fabulous presentation. and. I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, we hope it was uh, helpful and informative. And you should be getting an email from uh, ADA to let you know when a recording will be available on our website. And please let uh, friends and family know about our webinar series. And lastly, uh, be very pleased that you'd consider making a contribution to ADA so we can continue these kinds of programs. So bye for now, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Neil. You will now be disconnected by the moderator.